Welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Bandit the Podcat. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from working preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, we are thrilled uh, that we get to talk with Will Willimon, author of Leading with the Sermon in the Working Preacher book series. We are so glad that you are here with us, Will. Welcome to the Working Preacher oh, Books podcast. What a wonderful, <laughs> Caroline, Rolf, uh, great to be with the Working Preacher team. Well, we are really glad to have you here and looking forward to this conversation. And But before we get to the book, what have you been up to lately, Will? Anything anything exciting? Anything um, you want to share with our listeners? Surviving in the high-risk cohort. Um, been teaching. This year has been a, a challenge and, and much of the time a fun challenge uh, to provide people uh, theological education with all the restrictions. And um, I've been preaching around. I've preached about 30 sermons in the past year. Oh my goodness. Without leaving my home. So wow. it's been an mm-hmm. interesting year. Uh, so in, in your new book, um, now we're biased. Uh, you entitled chapter one, Preaching the Most Important Leadership Activity of Pastors. Um, I can imagine uh, that an overworked pastor might say, you know, um, wait, what? Preaching is leadership, and uh, what, I'm supposed to spend most of my time on that? You, you know, I hope it's not a matter of kind of adding more stuff to what pastors do, because I think in recent years, uh, pastors have taken on a lot more responsibilities. Uh, I hope it's sort of affirming what they already are giving much of their lives to as being important. I think I could make a case that just judging, you know, when you preach, you're with more of your people in a more intentional focused way than you are in any other pastoral encounter activity. And also I try to make the case that there's something about the Christian faith that is just inherently auditory, (laughs) uh, Mm -hmm. acoustical. And that preaching and the word go together, uh, the word made flesh. So uh, for all those reasons, I think pastors uh, underinvest themselves in the activity of preaching to their peril and that of their congregations. Yeah, I really appreciate the theological case uh, that you make um, for the fact that um, like you said, the, the, the basis of Christian faith comes because someone else has proclaimed a word to us. And the, uh, that mm. it, we, are, you know, we, are, we are a faith that is based on the, an impossible revelation that the cross uh, on which the Son of God died is actually the place of power. Mm. It's you know? a very Lutheran thought. I knew you worked <laughs> that in early. Uh, <laughs> cross, cross. Um, Good, good. Yeah. And uh, I think sometimes, maybe sometimes in mainline North American Christianity, we forget how odd it was that we were told this story, we Christians, and that we said, yeah, that makes sense. One thing I loved about being a campus pastor for 20 years at Duke was students are often not as well protected as we are and all. And a student would occasionally come out of the chapel and say, that, that's your story? I mean, that, that's your piece? That, that's what you're going with here? And I'd say, yeah. And say, man, lots of luck, because that's kind of against everything we believe here. And I said, surprisingly perceptive for a Duke student. What did you make on the SAT? Um, so, uh, I know I did a class in evangelism and I asked the students, how many of you can remember when you weren't a Christian? Mm. Well, mainline seminary, only about 
a third of the class raised their hand or less. And I said, okay, those of you like me who can't remember when I wasn't Methodist, you know, um, we got a problem mm -hmm. because we, we're apt to think that Christianity is innate. We are apt to think it's part of the American way. Uh, so we got problems when it comes to evangelism and mission. The rest of you have a leg up in that you you can still remember when you said, wow, that is the strangest thing I've ever heard. And it really seems to be true. Well, you know, that that's one of the things that I uh, appreciated so much about this uh, book, Well, is the way in which you are arguing for the fact that preaching is identity shaping and forming of the church or even reminding them of their identity. So uh, I'm going to quote you here, uh, you, where you say, preaching sets the terms under which my congregation can justly be called a church. Uh, in each Sunday sermon, the church is reminded of who it is and to whom it is accountable. And, and then relatedly, this is uh, uh, later on in the book, you say, while sermons are not the only leadership tool at the pastor's disposal, sermons lead when they, and then read people into the story of God's uh, a Christ salvation of the world. And so this, this identity reminding as, as, an, as a critical aspect of leadership, uh, I think is one of the most important aspects of this book. And, hmm. uh, and, and, and particularly, don't you think, Will, now in, in terms of what does it mean to be church? Uh, what does church look like, uh, particularly post-pandemic uh, and these ecclesial questions? And so how, how much more so then are we going to need to make this connection between preaching and leadership? We better. Um, I, I think uh, there, there, wa there was a sense in which well, I think of Gil Rendell and his book, uh, uh, Quietly Courageous, uh, says in his book, yesterday's good pastoral leadership is not good enough for today. And he wrote that before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, after the pandemic, I, I've said to students in my um, divinity school classes, um, you know, you, you better want to lead. You only need leaders. You don't need leadership when everybody's walking in the same direction and everybody's fairly well bought into the direction we're going. Uh, but we're not in such a time uh, for a number of reasons. And therefore there is a call for leaders. And so, and by the way, Carolina, it's one thing I loved about your book, uh, She, uh, and that was you really portray the pastoral role as a leadership role. Mm. Um, I have a little polemic in my book, I guess, against the way so often pastors in the last few decades have been reduced to sort of caregivers, handholders, mm. ambulance chasers, soothers of the anxiety of older adults. Um, well, fine if you're good at that and all, but now the church needs you to lead. We, we got to, and the future belongs to those people who will say, hey folks, um, here's what we loved about this church, but it appears we cannot do that and still have a future. Um, and, and we want to be part of God's future. Let, let's, let's go. That, that requires leadership. And, and I think uh, that's one of the things the important thing says to happen in like a seminary experience is to say, hey, lover of God that had a great experience in your campus crusade uh, sharing group in college, and then somebody said you ought to go to seminary. That's beautiful. <laughs> but, but seminary is not about cultivating a better relationship with God. In fact, probably Luther would say it's the last place you should try that. Uh, seminary is where we say, you're a leader. You have been summoned by God and the church to lead God's people, to convene, to orchestrate, to motivate, to encourage, 
equip that that's that's your Christian vocation. So um, mm -hmm. I think the present moment is a call mm -hmm. for pastoral leadership in a way maybe we haven't been aware of as much before. Well, I think I think you're absolutely right. And I, uh, the, you know, the other thing I was uh, struck by, too, is that the, the the very simple but very important statement sermons lead right and and they're either going to lead you know in no direction or they're going to lead uh they're going to lead somehow and i mm -hmm. uh, and but where do you want them to lead uh, how is it that we how is it that we as 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 preachers think about what that what what our preaching, what our sermons are doing, where are we leading people toward? And I, uh, and when you think about the fact that all of the other sort of surrounding aspects of church have been sort of really sort of stripped away lately, and you've got your, you know, your Zoom worship uh, Sunday mornings, uh, it, it seems like that that importance of the sermon is really, really heightened. Good point. You know, it has. I, I think now, you know, when people talk about participating in church, going to church, it, it's almost like the sermon zoomed in on that. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that will lead to a, a new sense of recovery. I know when I went to b b become dean at Duke Chapel, uh, my wife Patsy said, oh, I really worry about this because you as a pastor, as a Methodist pastor, inner city church in South Carolina, said, you got away with murder in the pulpit because you're such a great pastor. And you kind of earned the right to say about anything that you want to say, that you feel led to say. But but you you go to this big college pulpit, um, you're going to be preaching to strangers. You're not going to get to visit them. You're not going to get to know them. They won't get to know you. And um, that worried me. And yet, it, Duke Chapel was a kind of a lab test to say, let's strip away all the stuff that pastors rely on, like showing up when mama's in the hospital and, mm -hmm. and having those conversations after the Wednesday night covered dish supper and all. Um, let's strip away that and, and let's just reduce it to preaching and let's see what kind of relationship. We, and I would be amazed mm -hmm. at the people who would show up in my office for counseling or something who would say uh well you know i'm i want to hear more about what you said about so and so or uh are people who would bump into me on campus and be angry and mm -hmm. i say do i know you and they said well i know you i'm i'm there every sunday and and um i was sort of amazed how much preaching can do and i also think among us preachers there's often we're often impressed by how much preaching can't do and uh, all those topics it upsets people makes people uncomfortable if we talk about we, we don't we ought to spend more time talking about all those people who are bored out of their minds and have forsaken church because nothing surprising is ever uttered and um so preaching um I know uh, I was with some preachers as we were going into the pandemic. And uh, one of the preachers said, do you really think preaching is effective? Do you really think it's, a, it's an important mode of communication? And I said, well, all I know in Washington, there's a guy that felt called by God to go to medical school. And he went to medical school and he learned a lot about epidemiology. And um, I don't think he ever felt any vocation at all to be a preacher. And yet we tune in the evening news and say, oh, we hope Do Dr. Fauci will be on tonight. We hope, oh, oh, and Dr. Fauci will say, you've been very good this week, but I need you to be a little better. I need you to talk to your friends. Oh, and we say, yeah, Dr. Fauci, we'll, we'll tell everybody about the mask and everything. And uh, I said, He's a doctor. For, he doesn't even want to be a preacher. And yet we have made him be a preacher. Mm -hmm. And I said, thank God he stepped up 
and with a thick Brooklyn accent preaches. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think we, if we are in a time of uncertainty and even fear about the future of the church, that's just the kind of time that people say, hey, got any word from the Lord? Mm -hmm. um, hey, preacher, we're not sure where we ought to be going. You got any clues about where we ought to be going? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, maybe we can go in that direction. Let's, let's try it. So um, I think whenever people are saying, what does the future hold? Does this, can this church make it out of the pandemic? Will we ever gather? To me, that's a call for preaching. Mm. I, I want to tell my daughter that story. Uh, just graduated from college and uh, she was uh, going into epidemiology. Uh, oh, and, but, you know, she wondered about seminary. So I'm going to tell her, see, you can do both. Absolutely. You can preach my, about uh, viruses. My son-in-law <laughs> went to the Fuqua School of Business at Duke. He had two public speaking classes. And when I said, what? You're going into marketing, business. And he said, business is the art of talking people into things. <laughs> I said, really? I thought we had a monopoly on that over at the Divinity School. Um, <laughs> and maybe you think of those wonderful moments when like Obama would come out in the face of some national tragedy. What, is, what does tragedy and trauma do to you? It shuts you up generally. I don't know what to say. I just don't have words. Uh, and Obama would find the words and we would say, thank you for being our preacher. Uh, well, I kind of think many pastors are going to find themselves in similar uh, situations. I have two. So um, I totally love this book because I, I think that actually a lot of pastors don't think of the leadership part of their call. But as what, what I've seen in life is uh, when there are good leaders, uh, in colleges, universities, seminaries, uh, congregations, uh, those places do better. But uh, so two things about that, that like, first of all, I know uh, from just having read your work for 30 years now that you are, uh, you're committed to the, uh, uh, the revised common lectionary, especially. Um, at least you used to say here, uh, hide behind it because it tells you to preach the resurrection and uh you're but i think that's an image i got from walter brueggemann you know what walter would say uh if you're a coward by nature that's okay that's okay god can still use you what you do is you get down behind the text and you just shove that text out there and you can peek out from it occasionally <laughs> and say they, i didn't say this but i think this is what god i okay. love that but the lectionary <laughs> was um drafted the three you know that lection or whatever was yeah. drafted uh 50 years ago uh by people pr probably are all dead now and it's not designed to face the leadership problem that you might have in your uh, community so do you, you that you know uh for instance uh, a friend of mine was a pastor in minot north dakota when it got overrun with the flood uh, about 10 years ago mm -hmm. and half the town was underwater uh, and uh, that faced a major leadership crisis for the whole town. Uh, you know, the, do you recommend setting aside the lectionary for a while to address the leadership text? You know, and pick is that is that probably the best way to do it, or is or well, is there another? Yeah, I, I think uh, the lectionary, the, as you know, the, the first rationale for the lectionary is God's people ought to hear God's word read. Uh, but a second rationale for it, it can be a wonderful thing for setting the agenda for the sermon. And I love that. I love to preach and let the congregation say, hey, I'm preaching what I've been told to preach. This ain't my little thing. This is something the church has laid on me. So let's, let's see where we go with this. Um, but at the same time, um, I remember the woman who said to me, I went to church bereft seeking a word after the murder of George Floyd. Our pastor managed to get through the entire service 
with no mention of that. And she said, if the church doesn't have any word for us, in that circumstance, I don't know that the church has any word. Uh, so you run that danger when you, uh, on the other hand, I'd, I've also known the joy of saying, oh, Lord, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to forsake the lectionary and, and go with a thematic sermon on the, the current hour, uh, only to be surprised that the lectionary had something more interesting to say than I did in that moment. And I guess I'm enough of a student of Karl Barth uh, to say that uh, the church ought to be careful. Uh, the, the, lecture, the, the scripture sets the agenda and the parameters of the discussion. And I had the experience of preaching a Duke Chapel on the baptism of Jesus in January the Sunday after the resurrect, the <laughs> insurrection at the Capitol, and uh, and I, I I told Patsy on January sixth, I said, "Well, there goes my sermon for Sunday. It's just been trashed by those hooligans at the Capitol. I'll have to preach something else." But I stuck with it, and and I said to the congregation on Zoom, uh, "I wanted to talk about the thugs." that attacked the Capitol. I wanted to condemn to hell the entire North Carolina Republican congressional delegation. And I would have been justified in doing so. But Mark said, no, 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 we're not going, we're not going to waste their time doing that. You got nothing interesting to say on that anyway. Uh, we're going to talk about the baptism of Jesus. Hmm. And I said, well, what the heck does that have to do with anything, Mark? Uh, come on. This is a big national trauma. And Mark said, you need to keep things in perspective. And when the sky turns dark, when things are coming unglued, you really need to know who God is. And that's what this story, this is my son. So um, I mm -hmm. said to the congregation, I wanted to preach a relevant sermon to you and spread my political opinions among you. Mark wouldn't let me. He made me talk about God. Mm. Yeah. That's brilliant. I love that. Yeah. Well, one of your uh, one of your captions or one of the titles and one of the uh, the sections of your one of the chapters of your book in, in leading is teaching. Uh, I was really really caught my eye. Congregations go no further than their pastor does. Ah. <laughs> where you talk about, uh, you know, coming to the conclusion that pastors are a decisive element in the vitality and mission of the church. And, uh, and I think that's absolutely true. Mm. And uh, what is your word to preachers about the kind of that 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 responsibility and that accountability, I, I I'm not sure how many uh, how many preachers how much we think about the, and the, so much of that happens in the sermon. Well, it's a, it 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 is a burden, and it it is uh, there are those moments when you have these conversations with the Lord and you say, "What were you thinking <laughs> when you call somebody like me? I I don't have the right personality set for it," mm. and um, the Lord. You know, says stuff like, uh, yeah, I made such a good choice when I chose Jacob or Moses or Sarah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm really good at employment. Uh, uh, no, uh, it, it uh, yeah, I, I think it's also a blessing to have work to do that is more important than you are. In uh, mm. our seminary, uh, the dean uh, a couple months ago sent out a notice saying uh, our students report they're under horrible stress. They're feeling anxious, uh, depressed. Uh, they're, 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 and, and please back off on some of your reading expectations. You can still be intellectual rigorous, but without the reading expectations. Mm -hmm. And me, you know, because I'm the old guy on the way out, I, I, I wrote back and I said, hey, 
you know, I'm sorry Jesus called them into the ministry at a time like this, but if they're feeling anxious and overstressed and everything, they need to take it up with the Lord, not the faculty. Mm. And uh, I said, I think I could make a case. We're not having them read enough to equip them for what they got ahead of them. Mm. Uh, I, I think maybe, maybe we're in a time where we pastors can experience a renewal of our vocation to say, um, you know, I, I don't know that I'm that good in being supple and innovative and, and saying to people, hey, this is what I really think we need to do, folks. Let's do it. Mm. And yet God has called me and therefore I'm all they got. And mm -hmm. I need to do that the very best I can. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember uh, being in a preacher's seminar with Harawas, and one of the preachers was saying uh, to us, uh, I, I spoke out on race in my church in South Carolina. And they immediately met and phoned the bishop and said, move him. And I got moved mid-year with my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a racial incident in the town I moved to, and I said, I, I, I'm sorry, i got to speak out on it. My wife said, look, we love this town. Don't, don't risk it. I spoke up, and now I got a call from this superintendent. I may be up for a move this year because the church says I'm too far ahead of, of them and all. Um, well, my heart just went out to this dear brother. And I said, mm -hmm. oh, my, that's, I, I wish bishops would try to be more supportive. That's tough. And Iowa said, uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I bet you hate God for calling you into work that's this difficult, don't you? But uh, hell, that's the way it goes with a crucified Lord. You know, mm -hmm. uh, next, next question. I mean, not mm -hmm. one ounce of sympathy or empathy <laughs> for this dear brother. It's just like, I'm sorry, you're working for Jesus. You know how that story worked out, don't you? Uh, so yeah. um, I, I mm. hope we can be invigorated by that. Uh, guess who's going to get to tell them the truth mm. in a culture of lies? Mm. Get, get, who, get who's going to step up and be courageous mm. and say, folks, um, I remember the preacher uh, one of my students who said in a sermon, uh, he, and the sermon was on Jesus and his disciples, calling the disciples something, he's, and he ends his sermon, and he says, I have found you to be the most loving, caring congregation I've ever known. He said, it can be said in this congregation, when one of us suffers, we, we got their back. We, we are there for one another. On the basis of this scripture this morning, that's not good enough for Jesus. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you, mm. you know, it, it, so, and, and Ralph mentioned lectionary. I, I think I love the way the lectionary gives me courage and insight to talk about things that I would not talk about if left to my own devices, but that the church has to talk about to be the church. Mm. Mm. Yep. I particularly uh, I particularly love the last chapter, Preaching is Leading, although I want to tell everybody, don't just cut to the last chapter, read the whole book. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and were you uh, a teaser for people that uh, you have a great thing on, a good Christian sermon is a biblical sermon, and then you go on, but then you talk about the, the character of the preacher, uh, and you say uh, that here, I'm just going to read this, and then you just respond a little bit. Important character traits of faithful preachers, submissiveness to the biblical text, loving Jesus more than we love our congregation, desire to tell the truth, a willingness to be unpopular, a lifestyle that shows a struggle to be congruent with the gospel, and ability to receive the pain that people inflict. Huh. That, I mean, the character of a preacher, the character of a leader, um, I, I don't know that especially Lutherans talk about that very much, to be honest with you. Uh, 
we probably huh. need to talk about it more, but the in order to lead effectively, one uh, the preacher has to, in some ways, have a transparent, honest um, view of their character. How do you do that? That's a frightening thing. <laughs> you know, it's frightening to, to say, um, hey, I want to talk to you about character now, because, of course, what you're doing is immediately assessing my character. Um, but uh, darn it, I, I think part of Christian leadership is your character, who you are down deep, who you are when nobody's looking. Uh, you're in a public modeling role, like it or not. But it it was fun. Like we require our students to be in a spiritual formation group uh, their first year at the Divinity School. And I keep saying, what are they being formed for? And it bothers me when the spiritual formation is presented to them as here's where we talk about our problems and our aches and pains and the way we were brought up and the stuff our mamas did that was wrong. Uh, well, I, 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 so I made up that list and that list maybe comes from me. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, someone coming up after a sermon and being very upset by my sermon and uh, saying that you, what you said was insensitive, uh, it, it, things like that should not be said in church or something like this and all. And I sat there and listened to the person and I, but I was thinking, wow, I was president of my school class every year from the ninth grade on. And you don't get that way by being truthful, as Bill and Hillary. And you know, you, you, you uh, and I said, wow, the Lord has taken deceitful me who wants to please everybody more than anything in the world and has made me a fairly courageous person. Uh, it's only taken like 20 years of preaching for the Lord to do it. That, that's pretty impressive. And um, I came back too and I said to the person, thank you for your feedback, but God bless you, keep moving. Um, <laughs> well, here's the thing. I wonder if some of us go into preaching uh, with the incohate desire to be a better person than we would have been if we hadn't been called to preach. Mm -hmm. And those moments when a preacher says, I can't believe I'm saying this. I, I can't believe I have said this, and I'm not upset that some of my people are upset with me. I can't believe that. that, that that's, that's pretty good. So um, the character of a preacher, I think, required is basically the character to work with a, a, a Savior like Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and, and not resent Christ for talking the way he talks and for doing the stuff he does among the people. He does. Well, one of the things we like to do on this podcast, Will, is to hear from our authors about some general questions about preaching. And so one of the questions that I had for you was, what is the well, what, what is the hardest sermon you've ever preached? Or maybe what are the hard sermons you preach for you? And what, what are those? Uh, maybe they're the ones where, where, the, where people are like, you know, want to throw you off a cliff, but uh, <laughs> mm. like Luke 4. But, but it, when you characterize or when you think about what's a hard sermon for you, what does that, what does that mean? What does that look like? What does that feel like for you? Well, I, I hope. A hard sermon is often uh, instigated by the biblical text uh, when it's a hard word to say mm -hmm. uh, to people that you've learned to love. And I, I think I say in the book, I've always been intrigued by Rhino Niebuhr leaves the notebook of Tane Cynic where he says, there's so many dull, tame sermons, not because preachers are cowards, but because they learn to love these people. And they don't want to make their lives any more difficult than they already are. Mm -hmm. And so you trim your sails to that. Uh, and I think that that happens to a preacher. Uh, and I think it's hard as a parent, as a lover, as a uh, preacher, uh, 
to say tough truth to people that you've learned to love. That, that's why when pastors, I will say sappy stuff like, you need to love your people. And, and I said, well, of course you love them. They're paying your salary. Yeah, uh, they look like you, but yeah, you love them. Uh, but love can be dangerous. And mm. I think you've also got to love the text mm. and you got to love the Lord of the text um, uh, too. That gives you some, maybe some courage. Mm. Mm. Is there a book of the Bible that you've never preached on, but you kind of want to someday? <laughs> there are books of the Bible I have not preached on. Uh, but judges, I've wondered, I've, I've served congregations that I think deserve to get judges <laughs> preach to them. Uh, and, uh, but uh, Proverbs, uh, I, I I had a sermon on Proverbs where I, I basically said, I can't stand Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs, of do this, pick up, the, take precautions on dates, pick up your socks. And I, and I said, like, like a long road trip with your mother. And, um, but I said, the lectionary has got Proverbs in there and it's uh, better than silver or gold is a good reputation. A good name is better than riches. And I said, that's a nice thought except nobody is at Duke University who believes that. Put that on a t-shirt, walk out on campus next week. Let me know how you do in fraternity rush, okay? And uh, I, so I, I dared to try to preach Proverbs, even though I was against Proverbs and uh, it's bourgeois literature and all. Uh, the student comes out and says, Oh, that was a good sermon. I like it when you go pastoral, you know, with a sermon, try to help us. And I said, hmm, pastoral, what do you mean by that? He said, uh, uh, I'm gonna call my dad tonight and tell him that I am not going to law school. I'm going into elementary school teaching. And if he didn't like it, he can go to hell. And I said, oh, don't mention where you were at 11 o'clock this morning, okay? And keep <laughs> me out of it. I don't wanna know your father. And, um, uh, and I thought, isn't that amazing? Just going with the text and saying, okay, Lord, have your way with me. Some amazing stuff can happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you know, one of our uh, co-hosts of this podcast, Will, is Bandit, the podcast. And Bandit uh, likes to ask a few questions of our guests. And uh, Bandit's first question is, what is your favorite animal and why is it a cat? What is my favorite animal? Why is it a cat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't stand cats. I've, I've explained to my grandchildren, our family does not do cats and we don't get along that well with people who are into cats. And um, they've understood that very well. And uh, the, uh, so uh, I, I think dogs, I got yeah. a dog and yeah. uh, um, yeah, but dogs, dogs put up with you uh, when, when nobody else cares that you're home. And uh, of course their brain is very, very small, but uh, so dogs. Yeah. Uh, friend, uh, a, a retired colleague of ours, uh, two sons once gave his wife a cat for you know birthday and he said don't to his boys don't don't ever interfere with my marriage again so <laughs> I, think, I think he would i think he would agree with you um what's the weirdest bandit wonders what's the weirdest place you've ever taken a nap uh first of all that is an ageist question bandit <laughs> thinks that i'm gonna take a nap after this which i might um I'd say in the middle of the uh, American University campus, one May day, uh, I lay out there on the grass and and just uh, it had a big day and and, and uh, so I I think that that was weird, but but that's a weird question. And again, I think he's asking me that because I'm an old guy who needs a nap, but. <laughs> All right, Bandit wonders, uh, Will, 
uh, if you have ever learned to play or do play an instrument. Uh, I do not. I, uh, uh, which is due to the fact that I, I had piano lessons and my uh, teacher, it turned out I had a problem with alcohol and uh, during one of the music lessons, uh, she passed out and her head hit the keyboard uh, while I was trying to play. And uh, my mother said that that's the end of piano for you. Um, I could have been Horowitz. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do do art, but I, I, and I paint some and this kind of thing, but I don't, I don't do the musical, but, but I admire all for doing the music. And I've often thought if I did play an instrument, I would have had a more productive ministry because uh, one of my friends uh, was Will Campbell. And uh, he used to appear places and say, I'm not going to talk to you all about Jesus because I found out this is a required chapel and I don't believe it required nobody to listen to Jesus. So I'm going to play my banjo. And he would play his banjo. And uh, I did preach a sermon at Duke Chapel where Will Campbell was president afterwards. He said, God, I wish you played the banjo. You, you could have used it. And so. <laughs> you know, uh, this is a band that's never asked anybody this question, but I do think uh, one of the, the signature piece of uh, your uh, style is humor, uh, Will. In fact, I remember you gave a sermon once about how humor I was I was on Sarah laughing and you talked My about goodness. how humor got you into a lot of trouble in life. Wow. Do you have a favorite joke that you can actually tell on a on a preaching podcast? Yeah, I'm, I think uh, well, my sister who was uh, who's a college professor gave me a book uh, when teachers face themselves, and it was a book on teaching and understanding who you are as a teacher and all. But the book ended uh, with a joke that there was a student who wanted to improve his GPA. And uh, so he signed up for a course in ornithology. But he was stunned when he got in the class and found out it was about birds. And it was the worst class he ever took. They studied birds' migratory patterns and birds' feeding habits and birds. And so at the end of the class, they had the exam and the exam uh, had uh, 30 pairs of bird's feet on it and said, identify each of the following birds. And um, the student walked up to the professor and said, this is the stupidest exam and the stupidest course from the stupidest professor I've ever had. A uh, bird's feet, the exam, and the professor said, that's outrageous you talk that way to a faculty member. Uh, what is your name? I'm going to report you to the dean. And the student stepped back, hiked up his uh, trousers uh, and said, you're so damn smart, you tell me. So. <laughs> Last question. Last question is, Bandit would like to know if you think the serpent in Genesis 3 gets too much credit for the fall. Um. As I read Genesis 3, the serpent is our, our first theologian and uh, who, who says, uh, wait a minute, did God say, God didn't, you won't die, um, who disputes what God clearly directly said. Uh, you know, I think, but I do feel for the serpent uh, because I, I think human sin, human waywardness and rebellion, we don't need a serpent to egg that on. We, uh, you know, we don't really need Satan to <laughs> make us be wayward. We, that's the way we are. I do not know why, but it. Uh, so maybe the the this the it's not a serpent. It's a goat, the scapegoat, who sort of we we blame it on him and uh, or her or it. Um, they and uh, so. I hadn't thought about that. It it does bother me some of the stuff Bandit is thinking about, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, Will, this was so great. Thanks so much for hanging out Wonderful with us. Wonderful to be with you.
Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for listening to this episode of Working Preacher Books podcast. Stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org. You can follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher book series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Thanks for joining us.